guys, we are going to be finishing up today looking at the Italian Baroque. Now, we are going to start our journey, or continue our journey into Baroque art by looking at an artist known as Bernini. And Bernini is considered the number one sculptor of the Baroque era of anyone to have lived um, in the Baroque era of the 16 and really even 1700s. They call him the Michelangelo of the 17th century. And when the AP exam had multiple choice questions, there were usually a couple always dedicated to him just because of his importance. So there's only one sculpture of his that you have to know. It's a multimedia sculpture. Uh, we're actually going to take a look at a couple of his pieces, and then we're going to get into some Baroque architecture. So this image right here. Not in your Art History 250, but I want you to take a look at it because it's a new take on an old subject. So if you look at this image, it incorporates that idea of emotion and dynamism and movement of Baroque art uh, that we have seen on oil and on canvases like of Caravaggio and Artemisa Gentileschi into now marble and sculpture. Who do you think this is? Take a moment. All right, hopefully you can guess right off the bat. He is taking Michelangelo one step further. Michelangelo had the David at the moment of contemplation about how he was going to attack Goliath. Now we see the David in the process of flinging that slingshot and hitting Goliath. So we are, you know, you are about to literally, you could walk all the way around this sculpture and you see the dynamism, the movement, the drama, the heightened sense of energy uh, that is new in... In, in in European sculpture and but still distinctly Baroque. And if you if you kind of track the movement of this, you know, the Renaissance reminds you of classic Greece. Baroque reminds you of Hellenistic Greece. So we always have these ebbs and flows of things that go in and out of vogue in art history, but a lot of times they're just copying um, off of things that came before them and only really adding a little bit of slight innovation to uh, the new era that comes about. So we have uh, various images here of the David. We have an early Renaissance David by Verrocchio. They actually think da Vinci was the model for this. Uh, we have Michelangelo's David, the most famous. And then finally, Bernini's. Um, all in various states of the story of David and Goliath. Um, and all very unique, though, to the time period that they were created. And also distinctly part of the time period that they were cre created. We're going to skip through this. Um, just because it's not on the art history exam. And now we're going to get into the art that you do have to know by Brunini, the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. So this is actually on a side chapel of a much larger cathedral. It is multimedia. There's bronze, there's copper, there's stained glass, there's fresco work, um, all incorporated into this one piece that Brunini created about a Spanish nun named St. Teresa. Um, so to give you some context, this is, you know, created during the count, the counter reformation. So again, emotional work that is trying to bring people back to the Catholic church. St. Teresa was canonized, um, in the counter reformation in 1622. So she's a relatively new saint. Um, and what we have here is a sculptural interpretation of her diary. And she tells us of her visions of God and many involving an angel descending with an arrow and plunging it into her heart. Um, and if you look at St. Teresa's pose there, it suggests, though, sexual, you know, exhaustion, a feeling that is consistent with her description of spiritual ecstasy, which is actually where the name comes from. So the ecstasy of St. Teresa. Um, and she said, you know, she would be, feel these burning pains in her in her chest that would then cause her to collapse in this feeling of euphoria. So that's what we're seeing here. And she thought that was a sign from God. And if you look above, we have these rays of sunlight shining down on these bronze rods. And it looks like there's a light up there, but there's not. It's actually stained glass that's bringing in light from the outside. And if you look at the other uh, side, to the right side, you actually, it looks like as if this scene is being performed on a stage. It's heightening that sense of drama. And if you go upwards, you have a frescoed painting uh, that is, it looks like the heavens opening up onto the molding um, of this, the chapel itself with the... Uh, the dove of, of God coming down. And one thing you can't see yet, but you actually have the family that paid to have this piece of art created. They are sitting in these box seats to the left and to the right of the chapel, 
um, and it's like almost as if they are watching this show that is being uh, put on. But a very emotional piece. Obviously, the attention is at the, the center of the angel and 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 the angel with its arrow plunging it or about to plunging it into uh, Saint Teresa, and she has kind of collapsed on these uh, bed of rocks as you see that highly emotional face that she is giving and it, it actually caused uh, a pretty big controversy when it was unveiled because they said it was too overtly sexual Let's see here a little bit better but very realistic uh, very detailed uh, we kind of went through all this make sure that you copy down the, uh, the notes at the top uh, in the red make sure you copy down uh, the various parts of the of the ecstasy of St. Teresa since it was multimedia. You'll see her face there again kind of that overtly sexual look that she is giving. Uh, a little bit from down below the altar here and the side chapel. A little bit further back and again he created all of the uh, the marble pillars and the stucco work above so that is all Bernini and you can kind of start to see the family over here that paid to have the themselves added to the side chapels here. Just another angle, and in this angle, you actually see here the stained glass above uh, where the natural light comes pouring through during the daylight hours. There's the family, okay, and you can kind of see he created that sense of perspective through the use of diagonal lines of this very kind of classical looking uh, auditorium that they're meant to be in. It's also meant to mimic the inside of the chapel as well. All right, so now we're going to get into some Baroque architecture. There are a couple of pieces of architecture that you're going to have to know. Um, one of them, actually, we're going to take a look at the inside of a piece of architecture we looked at in the Manners time period, and then we're going to take a look at two other buildings uh, that you need to know, and then one building that you don't have to know, but it's still important. So with Baroque architecture, the appeal is going to be to a wide audience, uh, and they're going to try to use that, that idea still of emotion to bring people um, into, the, into the church um, and to feel a part of, of this movement of the Catholic Church. We're going to see the incorporation of Roman element, Greek element, but again on a more kind of ornate scale, uh, and even taking it above and beyond where the Mannerists were kind of that playful uh, of Renaissance style. We're going to see that continue. So we're going to take a look first, though, at a piece of art that is not in the 250, but it's a piece of art that we've talked about before. So we talked about the home church of the Catholic faith, which was St. Peter's. Old St. Peter's was a Basilican-style church uh, built during the time of Constantine. Pope Julius II in the Renaissance is going to tear it down because it's old and antiquated, and at this point, it's over a thousand years old. And what St. Peter, uh, or what will be rebuilt, is what we call New St. Peter's, and it is uh, commissioned by Julius II. It will not be finished in his lifetime. Bramante is the architect that will create essentially the overall plan for this new church. It is a centrally planned cathedral, uh, and it kind of looks like a Greek cross when you see it from from above in an aerial view. It has perfect symmetry. Uh, Michelangelo uh, is going to actually plan the ornate dome, and it's going to have he's going to add a slight nave onto the plan because Bramante will die before it's actually finished. And then Bernini is going to actually create the. Uh, exterior space where congregants still come today to visit the Catholic Church. So this is what you would see if you were in Rome and you were traveling towards Vatican City. You see the large dome, you see the protruding nave that's coming out with the main entrance. And this is what it looks like from an aerial view. So again, Bramante comes up with the overall central plan. Uh, Michelangelo creates the dome and he also adds this nave that looks very basilican. Um, he adds that there as well after Bramante's death. Bernini is going to come in and actually add these long, this long colonnaded area uh, that is going to extend out into the courtyard. And it's meant to be as if the Catholic Church is embracing its flock. Because remember, this is the Counter-Reformation. The Church is trying to communicate to their congregants that they are there for them, that, that, that you are connected to the Church. So that's that symbolic meaning. And still today, you have the Pope coming out, and he will speak uh, above here on that top ledge uh, to the congregants on Easter and other various holy days. And if you didn't pick up on it, the Sistine Chapel is right over here. Okay, it's still connected. And over here is the papal residences. So again, just some various aerial images that's looking out towards Rome. You can actually see the Pantheon over here. 
again during uh, this is during the uh, the funeral for Pope John Paul II back in the early 2000s. So now we're going to take a look at a church that we looked at in Mannerism. So this is the Church of the Il Gesù. It is a Jesuit church, and we're going to be taking a look at a piece of art that is in the inside of this piece. So it is actually an, a created by an artist named Giovanni Battista Galli, and the name of the interior piece is called Triumph in the Name of Jesus. It is massive. It takes... Uh, really up the entire nave and it is the area right up here in the nave and it is blending uh, oil uh, not oil paint but fresco onto actual and overlapping onto actual woodwork and stucco of the actual ceiling and if you look baroque naves are very ornate they're very decorative uh, a lot of gold being used a lot of woodwork a lot of stucco and it almost is, it almost feels like the figures tumble below, all right? Some are carved um, in the stucco that enhance the kind of three-dimensionality of the piece itself. Uh, some of the figures are painted, uh, and they're not actually on the stucco. They're actually kind of almost rising above the stucco, which kind of create, again, more of a three-dimensionality and three-dimensional quality. Uh, you're going to want to pause here and take notes on what I have up uh, in the red, but you just see it's the opening of heaven that light i mean if you were sitting in the audience in the nave it's as if the skies had opened up and this flurry of, of angels have just come flying out at you so it is it is you know kind of you know almost crazy how 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 radical this was for the time incorporating the painted elements onto the wooden stucco elements to create a, a really heightened sense of uh of of realism and also of an, uh, an emotional attachment and again you just see the the immense kind of uh intricate detail here of these these angels almost falling out of heaven and you know the triumph of jesus it's it's probably all inspiring to see in person so now we're moving on to a piece of Baroque art that you have to know the exterior of. So this is called Carlo Maderno, Santa Maria della Vittoria. This is the church um, actually where the ecstasy of St. Teresa is housed. So if you look at the exterior, this is what we would call a Baroque uh, exterior for a church. It is in the beginning of the kind of, it's in the beginning of the Baroque era. Uh, it was originally dedicated to St. Paul. It's originally then rededicated to the Virgin Mary in gratitude of a military victory in 1620. Um, and it has a one single wide nave, uh, and it has some side aisles on either side, and there's chapels on either side of the nave. Uh, and again, in one of those chapels is where Bernini's, Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa is. But our focus for this um, is by the architect Carlo Moderno, and this is the Santa Maria, again, della Vittoria, the first story has these engaged columns, or what they also call pilasters, that are in this decorative ionic order. And then we have round and triangular pediments. So we have a round pediment here, and then we have a triangular pediment atop, at the top. Uh, we also have this broken rounded and triangular pediment here. Uh, and then we also have all of this kind of circular scroll work seen throughout. So it's an incorporation of classical elements with more decorative elements of the Mannerist era, and then almost heightening it and taking it even higher uh, in the Baroque period. This is the interior of that church, and you would have the ecstasy of St. Teresa over here to the left, or I'm sorry, over to the right. And our next uh, cathedral that you have to know is uh, by Francisco Borromini, and it is St. Charles of the Four Fountains. And the biggest part that you have to know uh, about this is the walls on the exterior are undulating, which means that they are almost creating a wave-like pattern. And to me, this looks very much like Petra uh, back in Jordan. So it is named because of the square that it is in, where there are four fountains. It's a pretty small site. It's a very tight space where it's at. Um, and you have these alternating convex and concave patterns or undulating patterns that create, again, that wave-like pattern. Uh, the facade uh, of the the, which is the front of the church here is actually higher than the rest of the building. Uh, the interior side chapels kind of merge into one central space and the walls are treated almost like as if they are all sculpture on the inside and Borromini who is the architect worked uh, in shades of white and avoided colors uh, used in many other Baroque buildings. So when we look on the inside we have this kind of just white. 
and you know he wanted to create almost like what the color of, of heaven would be like so a lot less gold except in the altar and it's this kind of very pure space and that is it for baroque art all right so this is it for the italian baroque art we're going to get into uh, other areas of spain in our next videos that will be coming out when we come back from spring break uh have a great time on your spring break relax and uh i will see you again soon